Omar, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. I'm happy to be here, sir. So uh, we got to know each other. We were competing against each other <laughs> uh, on a competition. And uh, from then on, we've just been hanging out. And, and your story is just so amazing. I couldn't, I, I couldn't not have you with here. Um, so um, your story begins in the Arab Spring, right, in, in Syria. What, what were you doing before, before all of that? I was a kid, 14, 15 years old, having a normal life with daddy who was an officer, mom who was a seller, and eight siblings. They had eight siblings, four sisters, four brothers. So we've been fighting, we've been having a nice time. Uh, I want to be the best kid home. I want to be the best in school. And my dad want me to be the best in the school as well, you know. And my dad want me to be engineer. My mom want me to be doctor. And you have to find a solution between both. Yeah. So you make everybody satisfied. And um, so you became an, a doctor for engineers. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> I, I had to be something like yeah. that. Uh, but then um, I grew up in a really beautiful city and village. Um, my village called Albaida, which means white. And it's an amazing place where we have mount like chain of mountains and you have the ocean and you have the hills and you have the rivers and you have the birds, the trees, the colors during all the months in the year. I mean, it's like summer, winter, fall. Like it's not like we have fall and 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 spring in Syria. It's like more yeah. clear winter, summer. Okay. Do you, do you have snow there as well? Not in my hometown. My dream was to have snow once in my hands. I used to go to the, you know, to the fridge and open it and take some, you know, the snow collected in the, the ice somewhere yeah. there and throw it in the air <laughs> and fall down, <laughs> like beat down. Oh, it's snowing. <laughs> it's happiness. <laughs> yeah, it was my dream to see snow. I'm, I remember once we had like, it was snowing and just like one little place in the corner in our school, we got a little bit in, of snow somewhere. Yeah. And everybody was being there. Like everybody's there trying to look at this snow. It's fascinating. It's amazing. Yeah. And guess what I felt when I just came to Sweden? Snow. To the north of Sweden in the 1st of January. Ooh. Where in, where in Sweden was that? Luleå. Luleå. So a How very small, a very small village called Töre. Mm. Where is your first neighbor's? one kilometer away from you <laughs> and Coop, just to go to Coop to buy some food. It's a helicopter ride. A helicopter ride. You need, I mean, to it's buy the snow. Fruit. The <laughs> snow was like two meters. There's no way and it's freezing and it's like minus 35. My first day in the north of Sweden was minus 35. Can you imagine that? <laughs> like I, I've been in plus 18 in the worst case in Syria and go directly from plus 18 to minus 35. Yeah. And I had the best summer clothes. And you know, I wasn't very prepared to be, to be in Sweden. Yeah. I just found myself here in Sweden and I had to survive mm. until I met Astrid and Lisbeth Carbine. We go into that later. Yeah, yeah. So, so you were you were a normal kid, just just living your life with your. No, family. I was a special kid. I was very handsome. <laughs> I've never been a normal kid. Okay, I was sorry. Clever, sorry. smart, good guy. Yeah. <laughs> but but then then the Arab Spring and, and and what happened then? I remember when it started in Egypt, and my father was having you know that even the Al Jazeera TV, and. Uh, I was looking really excited. And he has his background as an officer in the Syrian army. Uh, he was retired in 2010. So before the nine or 10, before the revolution starts, but he was still has his background 25 years an officer. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so I just got, was watching my dad really excited about what's going on in Egypt. And he like sometimes whisper with us or with himself says, oh, that may that may happen here, and no, 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 it's never gonna happen. He's talked to himself. Never gonna happen, you know. We have a great country, 
you know, we have a picture of the Brazilian toe. Yeah. Uh, that's like cultural thing. But everyone had to have yeah, that. Yeah, right? almost everyone have it. So yeah. you, you, and I grow up my father telling me that our Brazilian is great. And our Brazilian got blue eyes and he's a tall person and he's handsome. That's how I grow up. Mm. And I will remember once I mentioned to my dad that our president has big e big ears and he's like monkey. Your your dad said that? I said that to my dad. Oh. I was just you know, a kid saying, I just saw my dad's hand just going up to the sky and coming in my face. Poof. And I just didn't understand what happened. It just went so quickly. And it's just like we're very shocked. I didn't and I didn't I didn't think about the pain. I just think about what happened and why. I'd done definitely nothing. And my dad saw said the door hears you. The ceiling hears you, the crown, the walls, the keys. The, s the share, the bat, everything hears you. Don't speak like that. Our prison is so great. And if you know when you're sleeping, these doors, they go and tell him what's going on. I was a child. So he told me they go and tell him that you're saying some ba something bad about him and he's going to be sad. So he's not going to help us anymore or we may die. So you can't do it. You can't say that. And I was like still shocked. Kind of. Yo, the doors go when I'm sleeping. So when I sleep that, that night, just like I pretend like I'm sleeping with my eyes, the door's still here. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> went to the president to tell him. Yeah. But, w but was your dad really against Assad, like underneath everything or? My dad was against him. Yeah. Uh, very against him. He, because of love, my dad went to the army. He was the first man to buy a camera, you know, in his hometown. That's many years ago. And my dad was a kid, but he was in love with a lady and he bought a camera to take a picture of her. But his mom wasn't satisfied with this relation, didn't like the girl at all. So one day when he got back home, his mom destroyed the camera and just destroyed the pictures. And he was like that. He saved money for years to buy this camera. It's the first camera in town. It's like it's the hugest thing to have. And he felt like his heart was broken. So he don't want to see anybody who broke, who broke his heart. So he just left and went to the army and disappeared for a few years. He just, you know, when you are in the army, you get your salary. So he sent money because he his dad died when he was 10 years old. So he had to take care of the family. So he just sent money every month to the family, but so they survived, but he never showed up. Like this few years, he got back as a new person who was working in the army and he got, you know, normal job after his, you know, um, you have regular two years you serve there, mm. then you get real job in the army if you want to stay. And he stayed there. <laughs> and my father experienced uh, like, He'd been hidden before because, you know, the army rules is really hard and you get punishment before you know what's your guilt. That's how the system is. You do what I, what I ask you for, you do my order, then you know what you've done wrong. Mm. So if I yeah, go to the, you know, isolation room 16 days, then get back, then I tell you what you did. So that's how they treated my father all the time. And that's how he started to be as well. So they... In the army, they they treat people really bad, and my father was in this system. So when he get more power, he treated people bad as well. Yeah. But I and my father hit me when I was used to hit me when I was a child because that's how he grew up. Uh, he grew up fighting to survive uh, in a way. And I just knew that he was really a supporter for the revolution when the first demonstration in Syria happened. 
and I saw my father following the news crazily, like just don't want to leave the TV, didn't go to work, I'm, he's just watching, scared. Mm. He was scared, very scared, because he knows what kind of regime, what kind of, you know, what kind of army we have. He knew, he probably knew what was, what was yeah, coming. What's gonna happen, so yeah. on 18th of March 2011, it was the first demonstration in my town, Banias, and I just asked my dad, can I go to the demonstration? Because it's not like I go to the city without telling my dad. Yeah. It's like we had really straight, you have to tell your dad where you're going when you come back and you don't, if you say one hour, it's one hour. Mm. You can't come back late, you got punishment for that. So I just want to ask him, I ask him, it just like the second I finished my question, I realized, no, I'm asking an officer. I mean, he may be really mad at me. You know, I got hit before. And he said, yeah. He started his motorcycle. My dad had, was a motorcycle guy. Started and that, yeah, sit behind me. I sat behind me. He drove me to the demonstration. And just a few minutes before we arrived, he told me that maybe one million people are gonna die there. Be careful and hide your face and no cameras got you, be careful. I was 15 years old. Yeah, why, why, why were you there? Yeah, I mean, I been there because a lot of people been there. Yeah. I mean, my cousin called me and said, oh, Omar, a thousand, I was, I was like, I was following the news as well because, well, you know, the TV was on the news all the time. It was boring, mm -hmm. but I mean, it was like to see 1 million people in Egypt demonstrating in Cairo, it was so beautiful scene. I mean, I was a very social person. I love to meet everybody. And can you imagine if everybody's be there waiting for you? Yeah. I felt like everybody's mate. It's a big party. It's yeah. a huge party. It's yeah. like Zor Larsson in Grenalund. Yeah, yeah. So I just was really excited. So I went there. I had no goals. I had no agenda. I had no knowledge. What is demonstration? What is this kind of stuff? Doesn't matter at all for 15 years old kid who grow up in a country where you don't end your same with freedom or what's your rights or what's like, you just talk, the president is great and he's helping us, giving us. That's how you grow up. You don't know anything else. So for me, it was like fun. A lot of people there, it's nice. I just go there. I went there, heard my father's words before I entered the demonstration. I went to the demonstration. I forgot everything my dad said. It was amazing, you know, 40,000 people for the first time. I see this meeting, like everybody's together and they jumping and they're just saying freedom. And it sounds good. I mean, freedom, nothing bad. Yeah. Freedom is good. I used to have birds. I was, I always tamed birds in my life since I was six, seven years old. It's a tradition in my village. So almost everybody had a, has a bird on their shoulders and that bird fly and you just, this bird come back to your shoulder. And I never had a bird in a cage. Cage. Yeah. In a cage. I never had a bird in a cage. I just used to take them while, while they were free. So freedom meant something for me, at least for this birds. For this birds was my best friends. Mm. So when they heard people in the demonstration saying freedom, freedom, oh, it's a beautiful word. It means a lot, I'm sure. So I just started jumping, flying and saying freedom. Felt so good. I mean, I felt all these people are together for a good reason, for something, and they're having fun. Everybody's smiling, everybody's glad, everybody's just like we had a person, uh, my cousin Anas Al Shugri, who was like driving all these demonstrations. He was on the stage and saying some beautiful words. We want to have a beautiful city, we have to write for good education, we have the right for we have the right to be able to work on the oil station because we have the oil station and nobody from our city is working there. Mm -hmm. They come people from the other city to work there. That's wrong. And we want to improve that and that. It's just like good things. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear anybody says that we have to fight somebody yeah. or I didn't hear anybody says we have to hurt or to destroy anything. No, it just was like about building, Isn't rebuilding the yeah. country, rebuilding the great, to make it, to make a great system, nothing else. And it just, I didn't understand one small thing is why we have like 
many hundred or thousands of soldiers on the other side. They, they don't look friendly. And then, like, they look like enemies. But, no, it's nothing scary, you know. My dad is an, was an officer, so I used to see a lot of weapons, a lot of soldiers. Soldiers, they may be protecting the demonstration. Who knows? I don't know. I don't focus on this stuff. I'm too young for, for this thought. But I saw that officer going in front of all the soldiers very slowly. It's like, you know, when you have a powerful person, this powerful people used to go very slowly and speak very slowly like that. And he just going slowly in front of the soldiers. And I was in the front line. My dad was said, hide your face. But yeah. you know, what, sa what dad says is the most exciting thing to do not do. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Don't do this. Okay. Don't I'll do, do this. <laughs> yeah. I will really do it. Yeah. Uh, so I've been in the front line seeing everything. And I just saw this officer going. And then he said, load. <laughs> all this guns together being loaded. It's so beautiful scene. You know, it's a scary or beautiful or something between that, you know. It's my country's army. I mean, kind of broad or something. I yeah. don't know what was my feeling that time. I mean, as a, as a boy, it's kind of cool also it's to really see cool. that. It's really cool. I yeah. mean, you know, all the first time, <coughs> like, Thousands of guns being loaded together at the same time. Then between load and aim, it took a few minutes. And when the weird thing is like when the officer said aim, this officer could be my dad, you know, aim. And they aimed at us. They aimed at my head, at me. So I, I have the gun like in front of my face. This look was like a distance, I mean, 50 meters, but still like, and it's really scary move when they aim at you because by mistake, they can just shoot you, you die. And it's, I didn't want to die. I was in love with a girl. I wanna see her. I was good at school. I want to celebrate the day when I'm the best at the school. I don't want to die because I had friends. I don't want to die. I have many siblings I love. I didn't want to die. I want to have birds. I want to tame more birds. There was some kind of birds I never got. I never tamed. I really want to tame them before I die. I don't want to die there. I mean, I don't want to die by Syrian and the army who should protect me. Mm. I don't. You don't want to die in this way. And he said, "Shoot!" Boo, 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 boo. And everything go for qu too quickly. Y you don't see, you don't feel anything. Just that it goes like it's guns, shooting people. You just see the first thing when you just turn your head down because you're so scared and you see the blood. It's not just blood. It's my best friend who I got in my life dying next to me. All this blood is real blood. I never seen that in movies. You know what? Because my mom didn't allow me to see move, scary movies. No blood, no killing. Even the knives. I was not allowed to have a knife in my hand to do not cut my my fingers. So I didn't use. I didn't see that before, and I see that in real. I just got scared, and I remember. Do you know what I remember? I remember. You know, there was a, like a little bit of smoke coming from the blood because it's too hot. You know. From the bullet wound? Yeah, from yeah. the wounds just coming. I was looking at that. And it's my best friend, like, coughing blood from his mouth and from his nose. And he's, like, his eyes changed. And he's just opening one closed one. And he's just dying in front of me. Is it a dream? Or is it a nightmare? Or just happening and real? And why? I just was coming to have fun. And just a few minutes ago, it was really fun. And I was standing in my place, shaking. I can't control myself. I can't move. I can't think. I can't cry. I can't laugh. I can't do anything. I just stand in my place, shaking and scared or not. I don't know. I mean, it's the first time it happened in my life. So I don't know what feeling I have to, to give for that. in my 
place until a man come and took me. So Omar, come back. And he went back and they dry. this man pulled me back to the to the mosque. Because, you know, church, mosque, nobody gonna attack you there. Nobody gonna do any things to you. But we know our culture. Nobody gonna hurt you when you are in the mosque or when you are in the church. So I just he got me inside. I was like, still. What is that? I, have I lost my best friend there? I know. I mean, um, we're not gonna, we're not gonna go in the nature. We're not gonna talk anymore. Uh, we're not gonna have calls. He's not gonna, he's not gonna make bad jokes. I'm not gonna be able to m make fun of him at all anymore. Like I don't know what to think about, but just. I was really surprised of what happened. So I'm sitting in the mosque waiting. I'm just hearing the, like they shooting outside. I don't know how many people died, but I saw blood. And they just suddenly opened the door of the mosque. And an officer said, get out, all of you. And the man of us in our group said, no, you get in to us. Because we, if we get out from us, we don't know what happens. So come to us. They're going to respect the, the place they are in. They just answered. If you didn't get out in a second, we're shooting. We shoot, we're going to shoot you where you are. Now, get out. Uh-oh. It is serious. So we got out. They tied our hands behind our back. And it was, you know, it's like stairs. It's like three meters high. And they just tied our hand, they put their feet in our back and just pow, hit you in your back so you fly three meters and you come and you know in the ground and your bow you feel like but your bones broken at that second they break everything and you come just oh well that's the beginning of hell why i mean i still don't understand anything and they start jumping over our bodies and just force us to say, God, Syria, and Bashar. God, Syria, and Bashar. Bashar is the president. Who I thought he was handsome, but he looked like a monkey. Who I was hidden by my dad because of him. And I just was forced to say that. I said that before that many times voluntarily, you know, I didn't, nobody need to hit me. I just said that how, I, that's how I grow up. I just said, God, Syria and Bashar, and they hit you more, see you, speak slowly. Everybody needs to hear you and say it again. And they jump it. Can you imagine that huge, big man with muscles and a huge head, like, it's like 120 kilos, Jumping on my head, you know, in my very small head, 15 years old kid. And he had like this really big metal sticks and it hit me like I feel my, it's too much pain that you may not feel because it's too much. I mean, they hit you, they hit you, the feet, your feelings die quickly because it's too much for your body. just felt the stones in the ground getting in my face, in my cheeks. So just getting, I felt the stones come in because they jumping over my head. I got pain, but I drew. At the same time, I was saying like, they destroying my face. I may not be handsome anymore. The girl I like may not like me anymore. Who knows? They destroying me, how I look like and how how I feel about life and everything. I can't understand a human being is doing that with me, me as a minor, and I done nothing bad. I knew. The only bad thing I did that I didn't listen to my dad for all he said. I just want to do the opposite all the time to show him that I'm a strong fighting gay guy. And they just 
jumped over us for many hours before they take me out to a village. Our neighbor village, where there's specific kind of people who is living there. It's a group called Alawite. And Bashar al-Assad, he's Alawite. And it's like, you know, Orthodox, Sunni, Shia, and there's Alawite. And the Alawite people, we've been friends. I've been, I have many friends. And I had Aghiyad, and I had many friends who was Alawites. And we grow up with them because I've been living seven years in Damascus in a military area where there was a lot of Alawites. But they took me to a village called Al Maurad. I've been there before. It's a really beautiful village. But at this time, this time was really different. They put me in a room. I remember the first hit. It was too soft. I didn't understand why until I heard the voice of a kid speaking behind me. Kids was hitting me. Ten years of kids or younger was hitting me with the sticks who was heavier than them. I didn't know why until I heard women behind me hitting me. What's the reason? I don't understand. And they were celebrating. And you know how you celebrate in Syria? You take a lot of rice and you throw it in the air. It's like wedding. And they was like just throwing rice over us like, you know, it's like wedding. They torching us. They were celebrating that for a reason. I didn't know the reason. And they were just like, kids hitting you. And then they just, they be in you, at you. And they just like monsters. They just doing wrong thing. You and know. didn't see you as human. No, no, definitely not. A few hours and you just feel that that's inhalating, you know, and then you get. Then they took us on a big car to the first prison in my life. Political prison in Tartus, the province I was, I, I was living in. So they took us to this prison two days. Endless torture. Then they took me to the officer who going to ask me questions. I was expecting questions like, why were you demonstrating? I was really surprised with the first question when he said, how many officers have you killed? And you were how old? 15 years you old. 15 years old, and they thought that you had killed officers. They know. They knew that I didn't kill anybody. Do you know why? Because no officers died. Yeah. Just civilians in demonstration being killed. No officers died, and they knew that. They asked me, how many officers have you killed? I laughed, because I thought it was a joke, you know? I laughed, and when I just laughed, he just stand up. I don't see anything. I had a, you know, um, blindfold in my eyes, my hands tied behind my back, so I can't see anything. But I feel, I hear everything. And he just stand up and came to me next to me and just hit me in my face. I just fell down. I woke up with water on my body, kind of really cold water. And he said, I'm not going to ask you many times, but how many officers have you killed? And I said, I never killed anybody. I'm 15 years old. I never had any weapons in my hand. I'm still a kid. I miss my mom. And I, I didn't do anything. So you don't want to talk. You don't want to cooperate. I, I really, I, I didn't do anything. I was just there, nothing. And he said, okay, well, let's see. You don't want to help, we can't help you. And they sat me on a chair. Yeah, they tied my arms, exactly like I'm sitting right now. And they took the blindfold, and they come with a, you know, tongue, or I don't know how to call it. And they come Pliers. Yeah. Pliers? Yeah, I think you call it. Yeah, and they come next to my hand. I hear that before pulling out fingernails. I hear that somewhere before in my life, but I never saw it. Because it's too hard seen to kid for kid to see. But I just like so I'm coming very slowly, very slowly, very in slow mode, 
coming next to me and saying, look here. And I was looking, yeah. And it just, the player started to, to touch my, my finger. And I was shaking. Like my hand was shaking because they're not going to do that. But I was still scared. They're not going to do that. You know why? Because I'm a kid. They're not going to do that because I've done nothing. They're not going to do that because my dad is an officer. They're not going to do that for a billion reasons. Until they did that and they're just, just coming in the, your nails and over your nails and just, they're moving right, left, right, left. And you just feel the pain that they take it out. Why they take it out? And it's still white in the, your, your fingers, like in the, the nails, still white. And the blood just suddenly come, all this blood's like river of blood coming and it's just and you try to close your eyes they hit you in your face and say look here you have to see that you have to feel that you have to look at that how many officers have you killed i killed one that's not enough start with oh stop stop i kill i killed two so oh, i killed i killed two three four five six seven eight nine ten what's their name what their names give me names i just I just killed them. I just killed them. I didn't know them. I don't have any names for them. I just killed them. I was mad. I was tired. No, no, you have names. If you don't have names, you don't need hand. You don't need mouth. You don't. Okay. And I start giving names. It's easy, you know, give any name. I just start to build names. Muhammad Mustafa Ali Ali Muhammad Mustafa Ali Muhammad Omar blah, 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 blah. many names gave them names and I thought when I give names he's done you know how old how old are they they married how many children the name of their children where to school or where they are living and you understand how bullshit that is because they know that's wrong that's not an information that's just something I'm saying to to stop them torturing me but there is no way to survive that I mean they ready to kill you if they take your fingernails they can't take your head there is no huge difference you know they can't do everything <laughs> if you killed you used something to kill them right yeah. what did what did you use to kill them knife no no yeah it was a knife no no you had a machine gun okay i had a machine gun okay and what is it i threw it in the water i really don't know i don't remember i just killed him i was stressed i was tired i was sick i was mad i was scared i just threw it in the water in the ocean no, you know what it is. And if I don't say to them what they exactly want, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what I'm going to lose of my body. As you know, I, I was scared. I was expecting everything when I saw my fingernails yeah, pull out. And I just, yeah, I... I am hiding it somewhere in my hometown and they said where I had to mention a place so I mentioned a place they called you know their soldiers they made a few cars ready and they drove me there and they know they know there is nothing because they know nobody died just civilians no officer died and they know that I'm a kid and they know that's good. Even if I'm a murderer, I can't murder 10 officers, you know. It's not like officers going in the street and saying, kill me, please. It's not like that. It's like uh, they know everything and everything can explain for them why I didn't kill anybody. But they don't want. They just was having fun. They really had fun. They were laughing from their heart. They were smiling. They were enjoying torching me. I saw the smile on his face while pulling out my fingernails. I saw that it was really honest to smile. I was enjoying having happiness with that. And they showed them a spot where they can start digging. They start digging. And they found nothing after digging for one meter. 
Tib. And there is nothing. The soldiers was really mad. You know, you made me dick for one hour and be sweaty, tired to give me nothing. There is no weapons here. Okay, well, they, we won't make it as empty as it looks like. Let's bury you there. So they put me in this hole and it was like, yeah, you scared me enough. You don't need to, s to do that just to scare me, to put me in a hole and pretend that you're going to kill me, you know. And I was like, I'm not expecting anything to happen, you know. Just scare me. Say you where is the weapon. But no, no, just, just put me in this hole and start start throwing the, the dirt on me. And the dirt was going directly on my head, in my eyes, on my mouth. But it's still like coming up from my from my knees to my stomach and coming to my breast. I start to feel it's harder to breathe now. For two reasons. It's like that dirt is like just you know, pushing my my breast, I can't breathe very well. And the dirt is coming at my face when it, they threw it. It's coming in my face and in my nose and my mouth. I can't see anymore. But they just like more dirt, more dirt. And say, ah, it's now over my mouth. And just barely breathing. It's over my nose. <gasps> I didn't breathe anymore. I just dying. Do you know, I saw the hell. I saw it. I was imagining how it's going to look like after I die. And just like became silent. Breathing again, they took this dirt off and they took me from the sun. And I was still surprised that I was really dead. I don't know what happened. I can't, they took me back to prison where my cousins been there. And they said to me, like shaking my head to tell them that we just started. That guys here can do everything. They can kill anybody, anytime, in any method. They can do anything. We are in a really serious problem. And that's how life started. Prison and prison and prison and prison. And then you, then you, then you got out of that prison and then you you went to another protest right after that because that was kind of the conduit for you to actually understand why the hell are yeah. we protesting right so yeah so i was arrested seven times yeah. and the first six arrests was like between two days and few weeks and i got out because my dad could get in and pay some money and give some presents like gifts to his friends and get me outside of prison. But the last time when I was, you know, on the 16th of November, 2012, I was arrested the last time. And I was sure that my dad is coming. I'm gonna be here for a few weeks. I used to that, you know. It's just hard training. Mm -hmm. And, but the last time was too hard. I mean, the question was harder. I was forced to say the same thing that I killed. My cousin was with me, but they, they, turned us and my other. So they forced me to say that my cousin killed somebody and they forced my cousin to say that I killed somebody and they forced me to speak. If I don't speak and tell how I killed, how I did, they torture my cousin. So I'm sitting in a chair and they seeing my cousin dying in front of my eyes. They hanging up him to the ceiling, not hitting me at all. Just saying to me, look at your cousin dying of pain because you silent. Speak, tell us how you killed, who killed, who was demonstrating, who was there, who was there, what did your mother do to support the killers? Uh, nobody died still. The civilians. We dying in their hands, you know. Just not real. What's going on? Just not real. I didn't understand. I'm tired of that. And I was forced, I just, I could not see my favorite cousin, who was my baby, my best friend, who was like my brother, everything for me. Just the screaming of pain and saying, Omar, I'm dying. Omar, he was forced as well to say, Omar, you're killing me by your silence. So I was forced just to say anything. Because when I speak, they stop torturing him. 
But when I speak, I have to speak something like, I killed, I'm a terrorist, I am a spy for, I was a spy for many countries. Mm -hmm. You know, during the torture, I became a spy for the US, became a spy for Israel, I became a spy for, I was really a good spy to be like multiple, you know, tasks from many countries. I could be really rich if I get that job. Mm. But, you know, torture, torture for one month with the questions, then we get the rest of the years. We stayed the last time was three years in prison. I said the rest of the years was torture without questioning. So they torture you to torture you, to just break you and everybody else mentally and physically. And if you think pulling out your fingernails and electricity shocks and hanging up you to the ceilings and breaking your bones and yeah, if you think that's as painful, it's just a drop in the, in the ocean of the mental torture. But, but how, how do you, how do you survive for three years? Like, mentally just getting through that not only the physical of of being malnourished and no water but i mean just the mental fortitude of surviving that how how did you do that i was thinking i'm gonna die every minute i was ready every minute to die i was thinking every minute about dying i used to think to wait death i just never thought you know, the first three months, four months, six months, you still have hope that you're going to get out. Your dad is coming to, to, to take you out. You still have some hope because your cousin is still alive. But then your cousins died and your friends, you, people who you get like some friendship with, they die and you're not allowed to speak at all. So you're not allowed to speak. We could not hear voice. I didn't hear my voice. In three years, I missed my voice. I was fighting with my siblings when I was, you know, 15, 16 years old to prove that I have the deepest voice home. And in age between 17 and 20, where your voice really get deep, I was in prison. Silence. In silence. Could not say any single word to know if I'm, I have a deep voice or not. And you know what more? We were not allowed to scream during the torture hours. So they torture you. And if you scream, they still hit you until you die. So you have to be silent when they torture you. And this was the hard part. You need really much training to, to be in torture for, for a long time without screaming, without saying any single word. You just feel the pain in your heart. You can't show that you feel pain. And how I survived that is something I don't understand. I don't know. I, I want to, to die. I want to die. It's like so, it can be so relaxing to die, you know. It's not like I was tired of physical torture. But it's just annoying to have it every day. And you don't die. You, you know, you know what, when they hit me with this, you know, metal, big, heavy stick and I don't die I think why you know this metal chain really could kill you know could kill tiger with a hit and just hitting with me with me with that and I just get back to my room and I'm still alive I still sit down on my square and think about I still alive even if they hit me with that. I remember when my dad hit me with the first time, hit on my face, I was almost dead. And now they're hitting me with this chain, with this heavy stuff, and I'm not dying, you know. I'm still alive. What is the power that's protecting me? And that question made me start thinking about God. You know why? I wasn't that religious. I grew up in a Muslim family, but I you don't understand. You just you just get the faith that your family have or the tradition they do and the practice they do. But you don't get the faith, the real faith if you don't think about it. So I thought if a human being who is like very really like me is torturing me and doing that to me, 
and the animals can't come in and liberate this prison and help me and the trees can't move and nobody can help me on this planet and no other countries is moving to do anything for me and I'm still alive during this torture that just means there is third fourth or there is power somewhere in some form that is helping me a lot and that power is what I call God. I don't know how God look like. I never met him or her. I just never met him. I don't know, but that's what I call God. This power that's protecting me while I'm getting tortured. No human being body can survive. So I started thinking about it. And I was once in the torture floor and you're just lying on the ground and you don't see anything. You just feel the pain in your back. And it's a lot. It's like really, really silence. But it's not silence at all because there is the belts coming. It makes sound. It's like, you know, echo and the building and the guards that, sh that, you know, screaming at you. But the prisoners are very silent. And the heads are so close to each other. So I hear somebody just saying numbers or something. Just the voice came and disappear when the bells come and it will make you know oh, bells come and you're not allowed to scream and you just some whispers come and go and I just like hear numbers like now two hundred three then I just hear number five hundred two five hundred three five hundred four it's numbers I really remember very well when it was five hundred two five hundred three five hundred four I get back to the cell the day after I get back in the torture floor I hear similar whispers I mean. Then I get back and knew that I was sitting in my room next to the person who was whispering. And I asked him, You whispering? And he said, Yeah. With well, this smile on his face, which makes you crazy, you know. Smiling. What are you, why are you smiling? What are you counting? He said, I'm counting the bells I'm receiving. You got a second to think about that? You counting the bells I'm receiving? The bells we were receiving is not like the bells you use for your pants. It's like bells are made from the car tire. A five, six kilos belt with metals coming from it. And this metal stays in your back when they hit you. It's not a funny joke to tell me that you count these belts you're receiving. You're getting hundreds of belts, if not thousands. So, and I said, yeah, I'm counting the belts I'm receiving. The more belts, the more reward I'm going to get. What reward? I said, the more belts I get, I see every belt as a reward, something I'm going to get in my afterlife. I've been here for five years. What? He said, I've been arrested since 2008. I've been here for a while. And now I built a great, great, great kingdom and house and yard. Huh? He said, yeah, I built, where? I was thinking, yeah, he built somewhere. No, he said, no, no, in, in my afterlife. I'm going through this torture and every belt is like a tree growing and try that tomorrow. I was looking at him as like a man who's just, his brain is far away, no horses home. <laughs> and he just, you know, I get out of town. Mm. You know, it's insane. Crazy. Yeah, crazy, you know. But it was, you know, something weird you hear. So you think a little bit about it. So I was thinking about it all the time. The day after I went to the torture floor, I, you know, it was in my mind. I was, I get it crazy. He changed a little bit in my brain how I'm thinking. So I went there, I was just, okay, now we will know the truth. Do I get the first belt? And one. They got the second belt. Poof! It's like a bomb coming in your body. It's two. And they have the third belt. <coughs> you die, you can't. Three and you got this the fourth belt. Now you you're done. 
you don't remember what 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 you're thinking about you don't remember what you are you don't remember anything it's like too much and it's just like that thought disappeared and like after a long time i get back oh i was i was counting so i get pelt and start again what and then it disappear and there so you hear some whispers coming and not coming and you get back to your room after two or three hours but nobody knows and you get back and you sit next to the same person who has this great big smile on his face and you want to really want to punish him in his face so you see him crying because that's so annoying to say this smile in this dark place yeah. And he said some few words, but I just lost like, the problem was not, I could not count. The problem was like, he was counting 502, 503, 504. And I just counted one, two, three, that I died. Then I didn't, then I just like slept during the torture. I could not continue. And you know how big is the difference between two, three and 502, 503? It's just 500. Who can survive 500 bells of counting the spells? Nobody. You're going to get pain at some point. You can't keep counting. A challenge. That man made me really, really frustrated. I get back the day after like a tiger, really empowered. I'm going to just, I want to, you know, count just to tell him that you're not stronger than, you're not stronger than me. I will count to billion. I don't, I will make it just because it was like so frustrating. You know, sometimes when you're frustrated from somebody, you feel like you have so much energy. I had this energy. Get back to the church floor. I get like four, five. Ah, you don't care about anymore about this frustration. You just can't count anymore. You get back that day. You're really mad. You really wanna hit somebody. You can't count. You get back the day after, and you got the seven, eight, then ten, then hundred, one, then hundred three. You got the three hundred to four hundred. And you know when you're getting to higher number, you really feel that. You're thinking about that. I'm getting. I remember the day I got to five hundred two, five hundred three. 504, I was like kind of, it's not whispering anymore. I'm seeing the numbers because I was thinking about getting back to the room and look, take him from his ear and say, I made it. I count and I get back to the room. I'm just aiming for 502, 503, 505 because the highest I hear from him. And I get back that day, I counted and I, I just sat in silence. I didn't say anything to him thought about how he made me enjoy torture how he made me see torture as a benefit see the torture as paradise and I'm, I'm planting you know planting trees so every belt comes it was like tree i'm imagining tree growing every like when you get different kind of torture we are I'm building a house i'm building a summer house you know that's childhood thought, you know, like fantasy you have in your brain. That saved my life. That made me get normal or sometimes really wait for the torture hours. And I remember a guy who was like coming to prison and you really scared and he was really young. You know, he was younger than me. I was the youngest in one year. 17 years old, the youngest prisoner. Then I got a guy who was younger than me and I was so like crying in silence. And then I just told him this theory about, you know, getting reward for every belt you receive. <laughs> I remember myself and his reaction. <laughs> it's like really want to hit the person who's saying this stupid stuff. And I just whispered to him, if he would like to punish you by face, do it. I understand how weird it sounds that go and count bells, go and count and find a way to count the electricity shock in your body, find a strategy to make everything very material so you can count stuff and you're going to feel great. And that guy was like, 
really want to fun punish my face. He got the day after he just, but he didn't survive it. <laughs> Nobody had this, you know, it's not like everybody really want to take this challenge. That guy, I was like trying to, to help him to survive the pain, but he just didn't accept the truth, didn't accept anything. He was just waiting to get out of prison. And the difference between us was that he was looking to go out to his family, to his friend. And at that day, I knew that my family being killed in a massacre in my village, everybody died, even my childhood friends. I don't have anybody to get out for. And more than that, a few months before, they arrested a prisoner from my village, and I knew that he going to be released. So I told him that if you go home and anybody of my family is still alive, go to them and tell them that Omar died in a prison died without torture, died in silence. He just slept and didn't walk up. He died easily. And he asked me, why? If, if your family alive, why don't I go and tell them that you're here so they can help you? No, they can't help me. No human being can help me there. If my mom gonna go and ask me after me in prison, they're gonna arrest her. I really don't want to see my I don't want to see my dad here. I don't want to see anybody I love here. I already have my cousins who died here with me. I don't want to see anybody here. And that guy went out and told my family who was at that time still alive. And he told me, told them that I died and my family. Then I they arrested a new cousin who told me that your family made the ceremony of your death. Everybody knew that you died. So everybody outside knew I was dead. My school teachers, my friends, everybody. Then I hear that everybody being killed. So I had no relation to outside. I missed nobody. Because missing and you can't see them in the future doesn't make any sense. So I just start to forget people. I remember the day I was just trying to remember how my siblings look like. The last one I remembered of my sibling who stayed for me within my brain as picture in my brain for the longest time was my youngest sister. I don't know why, but she stayed the longest. Then I just, it came to a day. I don't have any pictures. So when you say mom, dad, I don't see anybody. I don't think about anybody. Even the girl I loved, I don't see anybody. And that made it so easy for me because I start to accept prison as my, as my home. I felt home. It took me a year or more, but I felt home. I felt safe doing the torture. I felt safe being hungry. I felt at home. And it's not easy for everybody to make the pain, the prison, a home. So a lot of people die in a prison in the first day, first week, first few months. It's not like everybody, because if you survive a year, it's easy to survive two years, three yeah. years, four years. But it's the challenge is surviving the first few months. If you make it easier. So I started counting. I start to be creative. I want to be different. I want to take responsibility. I want to do something different because you know why? In my country, unfortunately, they don't see look at youth as power. They look them at them as very, you know, kids. They, mm. You can't involve them in any conversation. They can't help with anything. So when I sit there in prison, only one person gave me attention. Yasser, the guy who was counting. The guy who protected me. And in every prison, doesn't matter what kind of prison, you get a person you like a lot, and you could call this person protector. So I helped him, he helped me all the time. Especially when I lost uh, like my cousins who died. All my cousins died with me in front of my eyes. So and that person was with supporting me, and he survived many years. So he used, he had strategy, and he was inspiring. 
years and his smile was just crazy and he inspired me to take care of my teeth mm. you know take care of your teeth how important is that when you're living in this kind of situation for people's like take care of your teeth well are you kidding me you know i don't care how my teeth look like i'm not gonna survive i'm gonna die tomorrow if not today but i enjoyed his smile so much and i started to smile i forced myself to smile in the beginning until i used to smile i've been speaking to myself all the time in silence saying to myself i'm happy i'm home i'm handsome you have your teeth i had my teeth and you know how i protected them in a place where you don't have enough food you don't have enough minerals you don't have enough water nothing is enough and you get torture and you get blood in your mouth all the time you get just like i get a piece of wood from the walls and i used just to breath to brush my teeth all the days all the times all the times mm. and it's that's how i protected them when they torture me i just protect my eyes protect my teeth because if i don't have my teeth i can't eat my potato can't eat my potato you know i'm not going to survive i need my teeth and i didn't need them for the beautiful day where i smile and the beautiful day was when i die i wanted to die smiling and that's how my cousin died rashad died smiling and it was like you know sitting he died sitting and a guy said to me oh my cousin died and i looked at my cousin and he was sitting just sitting and you know pulling his yeah, putting his head in his arms we just got a small square to sit in and i just stop and i just like you know got my my head in my arms i was thinking about the, the beautiful world of prison and uh, he just knocked my shoulder again and said you know that shoulders got a lot of knocks all of them was bad news and he said no i'm serious you died i said no look at him smiling sitting sleeping and smiling he just sit stop and just he i guess i oh my i'm he died you have to take him to the isolation room where he with dead bodies I want to prove to him like my cousin is still alive stop being stupid so I come and knock my you know just knock my my cousin's shoulder brush head and he just fall you know his just head move a little bit because he didn't have space and he was dead he just died with a smile on his face he left the world prisons the world of pain of starving i you know i my brain didn't take it i saw a lot of dead bodies but he's different but he died and we had to carry him to the dead room put him with all these dead bodies the day after he's not there anymore you know it's just like your brain is freezing you don't get emotions you don't get feelings is the same thing that happened in the square wasn't it the same kind of feeling when when uh, when you were like what, what happened yeah. is he not going to be there tomorrow now you just like you, you know it's like your brain is freezing no emotions uh he yeah it's like my friend i uh, exactly when they shot my friend it's like he's not going to be i'm i'm not going to be able to see him you know and he's so you, you know everybody's unique you can't you can't yeah well i get somebody else you get a different friend I, didn't, my, my, i had many cousins but it's not like i can replace one with the others no it's just like it's unique it's just done and my brain is frozen my 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 feelings frozen i didn't feel anything it's just like it's not true he can't die you know he's in the isolation room his dead body but it's like he's not dead yet he disappeared i start really to feel his he's not here anymore he died when his brother was saying to me omar my siblings died here and i am the oldest of my siblings if i survive and i go to my mom and she asked me this question where is your sister where is your brother 
How could I answer my mom? Can I tell her that they died in front of my eyes and I could do nothing for them? They just died and they they be moved to the isolation room with all these dead bodies in the dark room with the blood in the walls, blood in the floor and the ceiling and they just move their bodies and maybe they burn their bodies, nobody knows. Do you think I can tell my mom that? I better die. I would love to die. I, I will never accept to get out of prison and meet my mom. I will kill myself before that. Never. Never. I will never try to sell them. I want to die. I want to die. Die? And leave me here alone, dying slowly. We, you die, we die together. But I don't want to kill myself. I don't allow you to kill yourself. But he stopped eating. He stopped drinking. And I was seeing that the first day, okay, he was giving his food to me. I said, no, I don't take your food. You have to eat it. So he started to give his food to somebody next to him. And I said, no, 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 no. No, no, you have to eat. You you have to eat. You die, die. But you have to eat. I start feeding him. It's not like he's opening his... He's not helping me any anymore. I really wanted to die. And his name is Bashir. What comes from... Bashir is like... From... It means good news. The guy who comes with good news. It wasn't good news for me to know that he want to die... So I was forced to open his mouth. I remember my fingernails coming inside his cheeks. So they, he just opened his, his mouth. I put the food inside and the water inside. So he's forced to eat and drink. I can't be alone. I can't just die, you know. He meant a lot for me. So he can't do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven days. How many days can he survive that? He can't. So I have to, to carry him now. He can't go anymore. And the bathroom was 35 meters away from our room. So I had to carry him to take him to the bathroom. And the way to the bathroom was an easy way. It was like guards to the right, to the left, hitting you the whole way. You get to the bathroom, you stay in the line, line of five people, and they torching you at the same time while you're waiting. Then you get into the bathroom, to the toilet when there is a guard counting outside. You know, it's just like the toilet is so dark, but there is doors. So the doors are like often closed, and there is a guard outside counting. One, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Be ready. When the guard say ten, if the door is not open and you're not approaching to start getting out, you dead. You really dead. And you don't want to die in the toilet. Everybody want to die in a beautiful way. Yeah, die in torture for much better than dying in the toilet. And it's like it was really hard to carry him every day. I was I just did I did that for myself, not for him. I didn't do that for him. I did that for myself because I want him to stay with me because I do, I'm not gonna feel safe anymore if he's not with me. He was everything for me. He was my friend, my family, my he was my protection. He was you know he was everything. And he he was he had a great relation with Yasser. So you also well not wasn't helping very very much with that. And the last day, I just carry him and go to the bathroom as every day. But he wasn't speaking with me anymore. We weren't friends anymore, friends anymore, because he didn't accept that I was forcing him to eat. And forcing him means sometimes hitting him to open his mouth to eat, and he wasn't accepting that at all. So he thought about that as misrespect disrespecting him 
and he stopped speaking to me. And th at that day, I remember I was carrying him and there was like two meters where there is no guards. And it was like, I already went 25 meters. I was dying. I, s I just saw the blood dropping from my head, from his head because of the torture, you know, the guards in the way. And there was dead bodies on the floor. All, all like the whole court is like dead bodies and just can't breathe anymore. <gasps> <gasps> he can't breathe, you know. It's, he's uh, not very heavy, maybe 40, 30 kilos, but I mean, for me, he was sick, tired, broken bones somewhere in this body. It was really heavy for me, so I just rest for the second on this floor. And it was the first time we had eye contact after I started hitting him to eat. It was the first time I had eye contact, and he looked, I looked at him. And he was smiling. And he got a beautiful smile. And he got beautiful teeth. And I saw myself in him. And I, will, I always saw myself as a handsome guy. I don't know why. I was, was cocky with that. Thought I was handsome. And I saw my face in him. And I was happy having this smile. And he said to me, 100 flowers. Me toward them. And I exactly knows what that word means. He just say that for people who loves, who he loves. And he say that only when he is really happy. I could not maybe not understand why Bashir is happy in this miserable, horrible situations of pain and torture. But I understand that that's a great word to hear now when I'm really tired. So I carry him, keep going to the bathroom, a really empowered, energetic, just going, gonna change the world by carrying him. And people was really proud of me. People was really seeing the hope, the future in me carrying my cousin instead for just letting him die and eat his food while I was starving. People was killing each other to eat. Otherwise, you don't survive. And I wasn't having, I was having my cousin's food every day in my hand. And he don't want to eat, I could eat it. But I said, I eat it, then he died, and then I die after him. No, invest in him much better. So carry him, go to the bathroom. He is in the bathroom. I'm standing outside in line waiting for him. And they're hitting me, and you just used to pain. You really used to pain. I was waiting for my cousin. And that was like the car was counting three, four, and I just hear something. My cousin is like whispering, Omar, Omar, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. I just open the door and carry him and start to run back. And run is, it's not going very fast. Run is going very slowly because there's belts coming in your body. So you fall down and you carry him again and try again and try, 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 try. And there was a guy protecting me, two guys protect, trying to protect me, like prisoners who give me a favor, so I give them a favor later. And they was like trying to put their bodies over my body when the guard hits, so the guard hits them instead for me, but it's still, you still get hit in your head, in your body. And those guys, one of them was like knocking my shoulder while I was going, saying, Omar, stop. And he don't want to stop. You not in a tour somewhere in the Norwegian mountains. You are in a corridor of death. People are dying of torture of belts coming in their hands. They say, I can't stop. If they stop, I lose the energy I have and the God's gonna kill me there. So I don't stop. I say, just start knocking in my shoulder until I just really got his nails inside my shoulder, turned me around and I say, stop, your cousin died. L let him here and go. I understood, but I didn't got it, you know. Yeah, so he said that, yeah, he's done with what he want to say. So I kept going. I said, stop, start hitting me from the back. And I just, now I want to prove that he, my cousin is here, you know. And I just like, I looked at him and he was sleeping. You can't sleep here, you know. It's like I'm fighting, I'm dying. 
and just like shake my arm, right arm where his hand was lying. It's like, shit. It's like, I just felt that he's melting from between my arms. Like, he's heavier. I have to put my arms a little closer to just so his foot body still in my arms. And she's like, you know, something was wrong. It was not. It wasn't, you know, he was sleeping, but it felt different. I just looked shaky. He said, take him more. Let's try with my, you know, knees to just try to his body so he wake up and he just he didn't wake up. He just wasn't alive anymore. And he just left me. He just left me in that darkness and that dark day of Mars 2014. <laughs> what? What is the next step? What should I do? Not nothing. And the God is hitting me. I'm bleeding. I'm hurt. I'm hurt in my body and in my heart, in my brain, in every single cell and every single feeling in me is just destroyed and exist in this scene. Just, I felt I had nothing to do, so I felt like weakness in my arms, so he just fell in the ground and I was like pushed by other people. So I pushed, I just came to the room, my room where people were used to see me every day, getting back to their room, carrying my cousin, who had a smile on his face, we get back in. People was speaking to us because we were not allowed to speak, but their eyes was speaking and saying to me, Omar, Omar, you are a hero. It was so great language. You can force people to shut up in their mouth, but you can't. Shut up their brain, their eyes, their feelings. That's something they control. Nobody else can control. And they were telling me this I was a hero. So when I get back that day, nobody told me that. I was a hero anymore. Nobody was looking in the same way. Nobody was proud. And the eyes were asking me, did he die? Did he die? look at anybody close my eyes and open again people's like just still looking at me i go to my square the 40 centimeter square i got and it's just like people are looking at me asking me questions with their eyes and i just i don't know what happened and now i'm definitely still somewhere he's just in the corridor you know he's sleeping or tired or something went wrong you know well trying to help myself, trying to convince myself that everything is all right, all right, all right, all right. It wasn't all right. It was all wrong. It was just facts I can't accept sitting in my 40 centimeter square, every single cell of my body saying, Omar, please die. Just want to die, nothing else. And I never died. I never died. He died, he left me, and he was the last person to die. The last person I cared a lot about to die. I felt strength. I felt now I can focus on something. This something is myself. Now I can take care of myself, fight to survive, fight to get freedom, not the freedom of getting out of prison, no. Fight to survive, to have a good life in prison. Start to focus on having good life in prison. 
And that day changed my life. Definitely changed my life. The day my cousin died, I started to be stronger. I, I paid my food to some people to get a place next to the door so I can do some exercises with the, you know, metal exists over the door, take my body up and start to do some exercise in my small square. Mm -hmm. And people were seeing, oh, and their eyes were saying, oh, Mario, oh, we sad for you. You lost everything and you're gonna die mentally. You destroyed, you got crazy, you insane now. You dying, you idiot. You doing exercise now? You know, trying to build muscles here in prison. Yeah. I don't care. You know, there is no more stuff to care about. So I don't care what people think, what people do. And it's what we need to. We all, to, we have to stop thinking about what people think. We have to stop caring about what people want us to be or what people think about us. And I stopped all of that and I became myself. I start to fight to eat. I start to fight to get my place, my square. Nobody was brave enough to take centimeter of my square. I was a tiger. I could stop everybody. I could fight anybody. I could do anything to still alive. I have to. I don't want to die. I don't want to die in this way. I want to die with honor. I lost everything. It's time to have a great life. And then you also started to learn a lot, right? What you call the University of Whispers. Um, the first whisper I heard in my time in prison was an old man. Really? He wanted to die, so he whispered. And it's enough reason to be killed. So if the gods hear you speaking or whispering, they kill you. So he just want to know something before he dies. Something great before he dies. You know what was that? The name of the person next to him. That was a dream. Because we had numbers, we're not allowed to speak, we're not allowed to say any names, anything. So he asked the person next to him before he dies, what's your name? He was crying. And the person next to him was scared. Everybody was scared, like, somebody's whispering, we may be killed, no, 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 no don't do that. And the person next to him felt, after a few seconds he felt safe he, so he started to present himself and he said i am dr mustafa ali mm. and the person next to him heard that and he said i'm engineer mustafa muhammad and different names and the person next to them he heard that whisper and he said i'm lawyer something his name and in syria you present your job your who you are first you know, as a, as a professional or as a education, then you say your name. So I just hear the first one say doctor, the other one saying engineer, the third one say lawyer, the one after say psychologist, and the one after teacher, then economist and designer and I was nothing. I mean, I just was Omar. And I just felt the question is coming to me and I had to whisper, and I can't say I'm a doctor. I can't say I'm an engineer, as my mom and dad want me to be. So I had nothing. So I felt, I felt it was shameful to just say Omar. But I had nothing else to say. I was thinking about saying I'm a bird tamer. I tame birds, but it doesn't make much sense for people who is not who are not interested in birds. So I just said. I'm I got a hug from the person who was next to me. And he said, it's you. And when you automatically, when you hear this question, it's you, you think it's like old friend, recognize me now or a relative in the family or something. And I was staring at him and uh, I said, yeah, it's you, Omar. 
Yes. Yeah. Really confused. I don't know. Is this time? Yeah, I don't know. I never know. Then he said, So you're getting the hundred. Oh. I understood. Yeah, it is me. It's Omar. It was every morning when they take you to the torture floor. Mr. Omar should go to the right. Why? Because for wo- the group who had the power I told you about, called Alawite. Alawites, for 1,350 years or something like that ago, there was a leader, fighter, who killed so many of them. And they hate him. And his name was Omar. And my name is Omar. So I get a hundred extra belts than everybody else every day. More pain than everybody else who had different name. And it applies the same for people who, who would, their name was Khalid. We both got this extra hundred. But in my cell there was no Khalid. There was only one Omar. So he hugged me and people just show, was like showing me some empathy for it, what I'm going through every day. And I was the youngest, you know. They cared a little bit about me. We whispered a little bit about what everybody work was and where you're from. And the day after I get to the door, she get back, but it, was, it felt really different. I saw the difference between yesterday and today. How I get back to the, my cell, I sat in my square. I was kind of ready. But ready for what? I was ready to, wisp, to whisper. Everybody was ready. It's like, it looks different now on this cell. It looks different. It feels different now. There is community. There is people. I get back. I had a, at that day, I had a, like really big scar, like wound in my, in my, in my shoulder. And I got the person who was to the right. He whispered and started saying, you know, I'm a doctor. I was just want to teach you how to take care of your wounds so you don't get infection. Because in case you get infection, we don't have sunlight here, so that your wounds not gonna help and it's gonna take very long time. And talk about you know your wounds. Yeah, thank you. You take a very short rest, then you just turn your head to the other side, and the guys <laughs> waiting for you. And he said, "Yeah, you know we go through this this stuff, but." Sometimes we need what we don't like. Yeah. I don't know how much sense that make. But he said to me, I'm a psychologist. And I practiced my, that job for 25 years old. And I think, even if we don't like being in prison, it's a great place. And when you hear that it's a great place, you want to really say to him, shut up, you know. I just lost everybody I had. And he said, yeah, but you know, if you sit, if you sit down, you know, you can learn a lot here. And if you, you know, torture, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Torture. Do you like it? I just looked at him staring in a really, I'm annoyed of his question. Do you like torture? Do you like me to pull out your fingernails, please? Definitely not. It's like a uh, stupid question. I hated the stupid question. And I no, so I said, but torture is so important. It's so great. We need it. As long as you're here, you need torture. It's so great, so good. I'm getting really confused, you know? That's like, just stop saying this kind of stuff. And he said, yeah, yeah, I mean it. Don't be stupid, Omar. Think a little bit. If you sit down and you're square without any movements for 24 hours every day and you're not eating enough food, you're not drinking enough water, you're getting torture. Do you think the blood the doctor next to you was telling you about gonna move in your body? Do you think your knees do you think your bones, do you think your brain, your eyes, your your nose, do you think your teeth gonna stay working if you just sit down in silence without any movement, just zero movement? 
Do you think you're gonna still alive for one more day, one more month? No, you're gonna die. Do you know how important it is to go, to go, to go every day to the torture? You know what go means? It means using your muscles. It means the blood is just moving in your body. It means that you smelling something different. It means like you're seeing something different, different colors. You see something, you feel something, you move, you have different place. That's what makes you alive. Thanks to torture. He got into my head. I didn't like psychologists because they said, I knew that when I was shot, if you go to psychology, that means you're crazy. I wasn't crazy, you know. But he really got into this small head, you know. I thought about it. And it was just the flavor of what he taught me in prison. And I start myself when I got this knowledge, one, two years of this speeches every day. I get my own way of analyze, like to analyze everything and make stuff amazing. The starvation was the best. The torture was my dream. The bells I getting, then I get to start, you know, with the reward, the more bells, and I start to feel really comfortable with pain, with torture. Start to feel comfortable. I start to feel like really, it's now it's really a home, but it's home with a family. It's not nice to be home. If there is no, no one there, I get a family. And this family was speaking about something very interesting. I was really interested to hear the doctor talking about how to take care of your wounds, how if you have pain in your stomach, and the psychologist talking about to feel happy, how to survive mentally everything you go through, how you love everything you hate. Mm. And the engineer talking about how to rebuild the prison how to make this a great museum or a hospital or somewhere or a park of how to build this room to make it looks great, how to change the infrastructure in a country, how to build a bridge, how to do that. And the lawyer talking about how, what kind of law we have and why we came here in prison, that we ended up in prison, what made that, how to clarify stuff, uh, how to build a system because we need a system here in prison. Even if we're in prison, we don't have a lot. We do have a lot. We have people, we have torture, we have food coming, we have guards, we have people, people of two kinds, bad and good kinds. Or people are good in the beginning, but they do bad stuff because they need how to solve this problem. And the teacher's talking about how we can use all this knowledge we have while we're whispering. And we got this all well, high educated people seen, sitting in circles. And I was in the middle. Everybody was whispering with me because I was the youngest prisoner. My mind, my brain works fastest of them. They were like plus 40 people and I can memorize everything. In case they die, their legacy is still here. They got to live through you. They got to live through me and that's, that's power I got. That's energy I got to be alive for more and more and more and more days. And I learned everything. I was alive, but these people who taught me, they died. They died because when they broke their arms, doesn't help anymore because they're too old and there is no hospital. But for me, they break my arms. Oh, well, just a 20 days, then I have the same art working as a robot, you know, working great. And, and I survived, these people die. And then I start to get youth. Y people younger than me in prison. How young were they? 12, 13, 14 years old kids with me in prison. For me, I was like, now I'm, you know, 18 years old, adult. I have a lot of knowledge. The more knowledge you get, you feel like more you adult. And I get knowledge and I start to teach these kids about everything I, I learned and everything I found myself discovered, like theories I learned in prison. And we created this university and everybody was whispering. So we call it a university of whispers. And everybody was enjoying learning mm. because you can't still think about your your hours you can't still think about the pain you have to think about something else you have 
to have a goal, and have something to look forward. If you don't have, even if you look forward to the death, mm-hmm. it's a goal. It's something. You have to have something in front of your eyes, something you're going to. And I had something going to. I wanted to protect people. I want to save lives. I was a kid. I was a kid. But I had the thought because I want to prove to everybody I'm a strong man. I can do it. I can change stuff. And the guards choose me to go to the dead room to number the dead bodies. So when people die, we have to number them as a registration number for the system. They know that how many people died, then we sh- they send these files to the court. So the guard choose me to go to the dead room every day, number the dead bodies. This dead body is not every, anyone. It's my friends, people I, who I met in prison who died in front of me. People, some of them like, you know, it's not just they don't have any mail. People being killed in many different ways because this room is not a funny place to be in. Even if you used to, to see that, it's nothing you can accept very quickly. It looks scary. I'm alone in a closed room with dead bodies, 40, 50 dead bodies every some of them dead, but their eyes still open. You think they're looking at you. Think if they just move, dead bodies move and do something. You're just scared, you know. I was scared. And I was forced to number these dead bodies. And that was my only opportunity to think about doing something. And I, I always knew there's, there's two kind of people. People who, like all people experience torture, but pe- some people during the torture, they say they forced like me, they forced to say they killed or they had weapons. And these people in the end, when they go to the judge, if they go, they're gonna be killed. The people who, c- who, who, who under, under torture confesses that they have killed someone. Exactly, they're gonna yeah. be killed in, in the law. Yeah. You know, in the end, even if they in the end, in, even if they don't die of torture, they're yeah. still gonna die. They're yeah. gonna die in the end. And there is people who was strong enough during the torture to do not speak at all. They don't say it and they killed. So you have dirty files. We killed, and we have clean files. We didn't kill anybody. People with the clean files, if they go to the judge, if it's a good judge. They may survive, get out of prison. There is chance. Mm. So the example I want to give you to explain that is my cousins. There were two siblings, Rashad and Bashir. Rashad died after three, four months in prison. Rashad, during the torture hours, he never said he killed anybody. So he had a clean file. Bashir got more torture, physical and mental torture. So he during the torture hours, he forced to say he was forced to say he killed, and he said I killed. So we have a clean file and dirty file. Rashad died first, and Bashir was alive. So when I take Rashad to the isolation dead room, I gave the name of Bashir to Rashad body, and write Bashir's number on Rashad's face. So we switch the files. So Bashir, who's still alive, take Rashad's name and became a Rashad, mm. got his files, and Rashad dies and we put Bashir's name in his head. And he goes with a dirty file. Because he died, we can't do anything for him. Mm. He goes with the dirty files. Now we have Bashir, but his name now is Rashad, Rashad yeah. and he's still alive and he may go to the court. Yeah. And with said, clean files, with the clean files, and yeah. say I didn't kill anybody. Yeah. And you could do that because because of the extreme starvation, everyone pretty much looked the same. People looked the same. Torture yeah. marks in their bodies. Everybody was, you know, really skinny, 35, 40 kilos. People yeah. dying, yeah. and the guard didn't look at you. You know, yeah. there is no pictures of you before. You know, there is no re- really serious frustration. The system mm. when they arrest you, they take picture of you. No. So they don't know who is who. And I did that. I did that again and again. And I told a friend. The friend told the friend. And people start to ask me to do that and again and again. 
And I saw, do you know what the good feeling is? Is when you see somebody who being called to the judge. But this person, he got a different name from me, mm-hmm. different number from me, and he survived and he got to the judge. After judge, I didn't know what happened, yeah. but he survived. And he didn't come back. He didn't come back. He just survived until that day. How many people do you think you might have saved by doing this? Hundred or thousands, I don't know. Not thousands, thousand, yeah. one thousand, like hundred. It's just you don't remember this no. stuff because you don't. I, you'd never know that you're coming to the smartest put them. Yeah. You know, you don't know that you're gonna come and talk about that. You yeah. just knew that you're gonna die in prison, but you hope that you get a great life in prison and you do something good. They want to know how I get out of prison. It's not like they opened the door and said, Omar, get out. Now go to freedom. No, it was my execution day. I'm going to be killed. They opened the door. They killed somebody next to me and they just scare me or something. And they take me to a room for 48 hours. I counted the hours by hearing the beep, 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 beep of the guards watch beeping every hour. And in every hour, he opened the window on the small door and asked me a question. How? Tell me how do you want me to kill you? And he always added in the end, be creative. How do you want me to kill you? Be creative means be creative. No bullshit answers. No simple answers. So I said, shoot me. And he said, that's what I call bullshit answer. Give me something creative. And I gave something creative. The guy who first asked me was the doctor in prison. I have to find a creative way that he knows or he get excited about. And I told him, you can't kill me with air injection in my in my in my neck. I die with it within two minutes. And he gets surprised. How do you know that? Well, I got that from University of Whispers. I know how to still alive, how I know how to die. I know how to kill, I know everything because I was prepared for everything. And it was really, but I didn't say that to him. I just said, I'm being silent, I said, you kill that. And when I hear different guard asking, oh, he's from North Syria, they slaughter animals. So I tell him how to slaughter me in a perfect way where he really can enjoy that. 48 hours, 48 of the same question, 48 times of trying to explain for them how they could enjoy killing me in a creative way. They took me after two days to the execution. Now you're gonna die. You know what that means? Now I'm gonna get reward for everything I was going through in three years. Now I'm going to my paradise, going to my afterlife. And now I'm gonna go meet my cousins, my family who already died and they where they are right now getting reward. They missed me. I missed them. Now I'm going for all of that wealth, all of that beauty. Now it's going to be happiness again. Real happiness. They took me, put me in the streets somewhere. It was the first time I smell something different. An officer was going behind me slowly. The stones under his shoes was like (laughs) while he was going. And he said, aim. Do you know what I remember? The first scene of the demonstration when the officer said, aim loud. Aim. Load. This comes behind you, just coming for you. It's a death. It's a ceremony before death. And all of them. And he said, finally he said, it's getting close to my afterlife. It's getting close to my reward. It's getting close to the home I'm going to be living in endless time. And he said, shoot. Poof. That in your ears because the guns was too close 
when you talked. And before I die, I just closed my eyes too hard so I don't see the way they killed me. I've been going through torture in three years. I don't want to see the way I'm going to die, how they're going to kill me. Because it's going to be one of the ways I told them about. I already know. I don't want to see. They shoot him. And he died. I I did. I died. That's how I thought. I got a feeling. I didn't know that. I never had that feeling before. And I never died before. And if you have you died before? No, 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 no time. No, no one, to, never died before. So you can't explain for me how it felt, how it feels to die. No. So nobody explained that to me before because nobody died and wake up again and tell me. So I thought I died. So I just like a little bit of time. I was seeing myself going in a gate. I was closing my eyes, seeing somebody going, and it looks like me. And it's going to the gate where after this gate, when you open this door, you go there, it's your afterlife. Ah, I got pain somewhere in my body. So I moved. I just, when I just kind of opened my eyes a little bit, I got some light. And that light hurts a lot. I just fall down and wake up again and stand. And guess what? Guess what I saw in front of my eyes? I saw a tree. A tree. A, a tree. After three years, I saw the sky. After three years, I saw the sun. After three years, I saw color. After three years, I saw life. After three years, I saw stone, dirt. I saw colors and a bird. I just love bird. I still love birds. I saw bird flying there. I was in paradise. I finally, I am in my afterlife and the rewards started here by having this amazing view. And it's just start, maybe wanna look, find my house here. Just move a little bit. During my movements, I just saw my feet. Just saw my bones, my, my legs, my body, my hands. It looked so scary. It looked so many torture marks. Blue, red, yellow, pain, blood, but my body bleeding, and there is some insects coming to eat. And I just looked to the in my up my legs here, and I saw some some maggots eating in my flesh. And that body can't be in paradise. That's something I really knew. That body can't be in paradise with me. I'm gonna be handsome. As I was before prison. That's how I'm going to be in prison. In, in paradise. So I knew that I'm still alive. I didn't understand anything. And a car. Stopped next to me. Come in. I can't do anything else. I just come in this car. People look different. You know. People had. People look different. Like. Brown face and colors and hair and you know glad happy eyes and like peer or yeah just and clothes and you know they had clothes and they just looked different they didn't understand I just it was so weird you know I hasn't ha haven't been seen something like that for three years it looked different but we were really, they were really scared like looking at me sitting next to me trying to move a little bit. To, from me, like Swedish people in the metro or the bus, you know, they just, if you sit next to somebody, they try to move a little bit, you know, and that's how people was with me. 
this car is just like scared. Everybody's scared of looking at me. Look at me very, very fast and move their eyes directly. I didn't understand what's going on. I ended up in Damascus. He said, just get out of the car. Get out of the car. Sit down on the ground next to the mosque mosque and church together, built together next to each other. Sat there and three guys came to me and gave me a phone and said, call somebody. I had nobody. I was alone, very lonely. Everybody else died. If not in real, they died in my brain, in my memory. I don't remember anybody. I don't remember anything. So I said, I don't have anybody to call. I don't have a numbers. I don't remember. I just remembered Said Naya, the name of the last prisoner was him. And it was so much darkness in this world. And they get scared. But they get back to me again. Some fruits. Look at fruits. Colored fruits. And I got a hug this fruit and say, eat it. No. I can't tell you. I eat it, it's going to disappear. I miss fruit. I miss this flavor. I can't eat it. I want it to be with me. I want a color. I want something. So I hug it and don't eat it. Destroy it in my hands because I'm like just hugging it so hardly and just can't, can't let it go. Mm. And these people was like really not understanding what's going on. And like for them, I was like homeless starving on the street not a person who was in prison who was a hero trying to protect any some people or who was a person who lost everything just for them i was just homeless they gave me the phone again to say call somebody i don't remember anybody but i remember that they had something in my body showed them my arm I had a phone number written on my arm. I used to write this phone number every day after the torture. Take blood from my body and write this phone number on my arm and write it in the wall. I forget whose phone, whose phone number was it. I don't remember. But I just did that every day. And I said to them, call this phone number. They called this phone number. She said, hi. And I said, coughing blood at the same time. <coughs> hi. Hi. I'm Omar. I don't know. I don't recognize her voice. And she said, Omar, I love you. Stay where you are. Don't move. We're coming for you. Stay where you are. She's just hung on. I don't know who it was. And a man came and took me to a hotel room. And told me you're going to meet your mom. I had no picture in my head. How my mom looks like. But I had a feeling. It tells me how it is. To have a mom. I had a feeling tells me that. Mom. What is mom? Mother. What's the relation between mother? How strong is it? a feeling to tell me that and I just get, get really, ex really sad, happy excited, tired bored dead life different mixed, mixed feelings don't understand just want to cry and go and see my mom we went there, he opened the door I got in Open the door. I go in. I don't see anybody in the room. Why? He betrayed me or something. I don't know. Who is this guy? I don't know him. Get back. Stand in front of the bathroom's door. Waiting my mom to get out. In the bathroom. I waited. And I waited. And I waited. 
she never got out of the door. I knew there was nobody inside, but I had a hope. I don't want to lose. But then I can't wait anymore. I opened the door. Look, there is nobody inside. I felt just disappointed. I felt I really want to die. I told him, can you kill me? Please kill me. I can't. I, mean, I can't. I'm just... I can't do it anymore. I can't just... I want to die for the last time. I died so many times, but when am I I'm alive? Why? I don't understand why they didn't... I didn't understand why I'm alive. And he said, you're going to talk to your mom through Skype. I didn't understand, but now it doesn't make any sense for me. It doesn't, it's not important anymore. I'm already done. I want to die. And I went inside the room. And going slowly and coming. And it was a mirror. <laughs> I just saw something quickly. And I moved my head to see what's, what is seen. In the mirror, it's like, I looked again, and I looked, no, I saw an ugly face, a very ugly face. I saw eyes, the blood is coming out of them, nose and mouth bleeding, and I saw a really weak person, scary, ugly, nobody want to look at, I don't. I didn't want to look at that person. He was so ugly and tired and dead. And I understood why people in that car was scared, looking at me scared. I understood because I didn't look like human being. I looked like monster. It's people have the right to be scared of seeing me in the street. I was 34 kilos, 20 years old. The man opened the sky, but saw a lot of people on the screen. I never met any of them. They didn't look like they know me at all. It was a really weird conversation. They end the call and they said, the man next to me received a voice message on WhatsApp and it was a woman laughing, saying, <laughs> you tried to, you're trying to track me with just a few foot shop and a few bones, and you say you want $20,000 for that? It's not my son. My son is handsome. Once she said handsome, I got some feelings. It, I remember I was handsome, you know. It should be my mom. <laughs> you know, that's true. I'm, I was handsome. I remember when she was talking during the Skype in this few seconds, the woman in the center had a picture of a handsome guy. I never met him, but it was a beautiful picture. And we ended the call. He said $20,000. She said $20,000 in the WhatsApp. I didn't understand what's going on. And I asked him, what is that about? I mean, I just did it. I just curious. I just want to ask a question. Mm. And he said, do you know how you get out of prison? I didn't get out of prison. I went to execution. They killed me there. I said, no. I paid $10,000 to get you out of Sinai. And your mom's supposed to pay $20,000 to get you from me. And I said, how? He said, do you remember how, what happened in the room before they take you? Very well. They killed the person next to me, who was my best friend at that time. And I pulled his body out of the room. I knew later that my best friend who died next to me, it was his day to be released. He had clean files. And it was my day to be killed. I had dirty files. They killed him, and they gave him my files, my name, and they took me outside with his name, his files. It's just the exact, the accurate way 
I used to protect people's lives. The same thing you did. In the prison. I saved people by that, and that's how. That's what saved my life in the last second. So you got, you really got reward in different ways in your life. Now, I'm really getting reward. I started my engineering education to be what my dad, who died, wished me to be, to be as Yasser, the guy who built that faith in my brain. He was an engineer as well. Mm. And I do a lot of public speaking, which I love. I feel empowered. I feel energy. I feel the happiness. I really feel every second, every story I tell, I just relive everything. I have these feelings. Get back to me. And I want it to be with me. I get all my strength by getting these feelings back. I never, I will never forget. I will never forget what happened. I can forgive. I do. But I can't forget it. And I don't want it because it's my energy. It's my power. My past is my future. I'm using it to get strong mentality to keep going. I think, and I always say, the best experience in my life was in prison. The second best experience in my life was the sickness I got, tuberculosis. The third best experience was taking the rubber boat from Turkey to Greece. In all these three, one thing is in common. I risk my life very much. But if I never been in prison, I will be in my hometown, in my village, where they killed everybody. So when I was in prison, prison protected me of, king, of being killed in my village in this massacre. So I survived because I was in prison. TBC, to be closed, the sickness, without it, they could not take me from Sydney and change the files because it make me skinny, tired. Mm. And even with tuberculosis in my way to Turkey, escape Syria, go to Turkey, the guards stopped me and knew they knew my name, Omar, and started killing me. And I coughed blood. And when they saw the blood, I told them it had to be closed. And they get scared of that because that sickness could kill them. They're going to get this bacteria. So they get scared. They say, oh, just get him out of town. And that's how I survived. And without to be close, I will never take the rubber boat to Greece, Macedonia, Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, Austria, Germany, Denmark, Sweden. Sweden, where I get my Swedish family. Eva Kalle, William, Felix, Jakob. So what, what organizations are you working with now to be able to, to do something about this? I had a little bit of trouble to find the right organization to support. I never thought, I never said I, I really trust this organization for many different reasons. And it's not easy to trust anyone, anytime after three years of being tortured by a human, human being. But then I was invited to Brown University to talk. Um, so I've been speaking at Brown University, then Short time after, a guy called me through Facebook and said, Omar, you, I have, we have to bring you to the U.S. to do some s s public speaking. And I said, oh, well, I'm here in Boston. And I said, oh, I am in D.C. Let's meet in New York. I traveled to New York. It was nice to be in New York for the first time in my life. I never thought I would be there. And he said, let's drive to D.C. We went to DC, we started doing public speaking, we went to the Holocaust Museum, that guy introduced me to some congressmen in the Congress, we did some, some events there. Then I got back to Sweden the month after he said, come again. And that guy, his name is Moaz Mustafa, the executive director of the, an organization called the Syrian Emergency Task Force. The first organization I really trust. And he said to me, we can do a lot while you're here. And I saw energy I can't describe. That guy was working 
like I had a trouble the first, you know, the first day with him. Like we had meeting, 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 meeting. Then he eat hot dogs. Then he meeting, meeting. Then he sleep. Like I was starving with him. I got, I just like not really excited doing a lot of meetings, but we got no food. You know, I was doing a lot. Yeah, Omar, we eat later. You know, we eat later. Now we have to do something. We have to help the Syrian people. And he's Palestinian American. You know, he grew up in American in Arkansas and thought if that guy is helping Syria, working so many hours, don't care about eating, drinking, and he's just working so hard for Syria and he grew up in the US. Well, I am required to do double much more than him working. So I just went to every meeting. I really would love to do that. And I go on meetings, meetings, meet on interesting people, do talks. I could do five talks every day. I don't care. I just will speak, tell the truth that's going on here and there and be on TV, on CNN, be on a newspaper, be with the national public radio, be in different platforms. I really want to help as much as his, that guy does. And I met Anna, Anna Daly Gibson, who was helping Moaz, American girl from Philadelphia. And that day that she introduced me to her family as well, his dad and his mom and her three sisters. And I just like, so, you know, it's Americans, they really social people, they just, <laughs> you got friends with them quickly. And I just, I just saw that family, they nice family and they helping, they working. Anna was working for Syria a lot, many hours. But working with Maz like is 24 hours every day. You don't sleep. And Anna was doing that all the time. It was a great person. I really loved Anna so quickly. And then I met her family, which was a great family. Everybody cares. Everybody knows what's going on. Everybody helps. And I just like, if these people's helping, I, I have to do more. I really want to do more. Get back to Sweden. To my Sweden is my home. Sweden is my country. Even if I don't have this the Swedish passport yet, but I really am home. I feel home when I land in Orlando. I feel that. And I get back to Sweden, want to do more. Get back to the US again. Then I, I went home to Philly, you know, to the American family I met. And I kind of start to call them after a like, few visits, like, it's my family. I know, I know Anna, Chavon, Maeve, Bridget, and mommy, daddy, you know. <laughs> and, you know, Maeve is a great person. She's so good reader she tell me stories and Bridget is so smart she is so smart and Chavan's the cool girl home and Anna's the wise oldest oldest sister and daddy was perfect ears and he tell the story about his perfect ears you know his ears are connected and mom who's like he's just like I tell her you have great daughters she says I know instead of saying thank you she said I know you know I love them I love your daughters yeah I love them too <laughs> And she's just amazing people yeah. and helping doing so much. That made me so empowered. And I met, I am so, I'm so, I so, I so much love people. Mm. I mean, want to meet the entire planet in, during a day. But that daily Gibson family, they changed my brain. I mean, it gets so quickly. I love them so much. We talk almost every day, you know, and I got the same thing in Sweden. When I just arrived to Sweden, I met Jacob, funny, and Sally in the hospital. Jacob introduced me to his mom, who was Eva Hamilton, the, the former director of the Swedish TV. And they said to me, move and live with us. I moved, met William, Felix, Yasmin, and met everybody, saw again, everybody. And just like these people were so great. And everybody's willing to help. And that's willingness is so, it's so important. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people don't know what's going on because they don't care for some reasons. Because they think about their problems are the biggest problems on this planet. You know, I've been bold in school and that's worse than life. No, it's really bad. It's really bad, but it's a problem you can solve. It's really bad a problem, but you can solve. There is something else to compare with. You know, people slaughtered somewhere. You know, the weather is bad. It's not good enough not good reason to be depressed, you know? It's too dark, we'll have a light home, you know? And that's, that's just the Omar attitude. Me and my girlfriend, we've been talking about that because we've, we've heard your lectures a couple of times and it's just 
seeing, even though you've been tortured for three years, just seeing the positive side of it and what it has brought you today. It's just so powerful. And, and I mean, everything that everyone meets every day, all of the small problems that I meet now, I'm just like, this is nothing. Th what? what? I can't, this is going to lead to something positive in the end, no matter how long it has to take. Um, you know, torture was just exercise and starvation was cleaning my stomach. <laughs> That's easy. Yeah. Yeah, but now you're in. You're, you're you're doing lectures. You're trying to. I'm doing a lot of lectures in the U.S. in Europe, and I'm very soon the next year starting going to Australia to start speaking in Australia. I would love to go to Canada as well. Mm -hmm. I want to go everywhere, do public speaking about the University of Whispers, and do my lectures about trauma as a drive force. How to use your past or use your nightmares to get power of that mm -hmm. drive force to keep you alive a long time with like be as a great uh, creative person. Uh, I don't want to say I'm a creative, but I'm still alive, breathing and having a really good life. I get a great year. One of the most important years of my life was a year where I worked at BCG, Boston Consulting Group. Great firm. I got a family. I really got a family. Not just family in Stockholm, I just got a family in the Nordics. I just met everybody from Nordic's offices and I've been, I've been in other places and all of them was supporting, like supported me a lot. I mean, the, the, the Stockholm, um, the Stockholm office, the CEO there is like Thomas Jensen. It's like great person who just supported me with everything I wanted. Mm. And I got, got to work with different cases and do different stuff. And at the same time, I got time to get my public speaking. They supported me and give me the free time to go, to travel around to do. And they, they I get great connections through BCG. And they were amazing people. Mm. Should I mention Thomas or Hannah Easton, which was like head of operation, the person who looks very, very serious. But she's so sweet, so amazing. She's, I love her, mm. you know? I was so scared when I first met her and she had like a little bit of scare on scare. I was like scared. Oh, I'm not going to understand. But then I just got her and she's so amazing person. What it's like, I, there's a person who, who did a lot <laughs> for me, Stefan Lawson, who was working at BCG, a man who really opened his home like Eva and Kali did. He opened his home. He said to me, move and live with us. And that man changed a lot. He changed my focus. He brought me to a different world. He made me like a different person, gave me a little bit of responsibility, opened BCG for me in a way. Like uh, through him, I got to, to do a public speech at, at BCG, public speaking at BCG. Then after that, I got to work at BCG. Um, and that man is just like incredible. Mm. He done he done great projects in his life, and he had a really great background and been stu he studied at Harvard and have really good knowledge about. Well, we've been talking about something uh, about everything from culture to healthcare, uh, value based healthcare, and everything. And I just that is the reward mm. I was searching for during my time in prison to meet this amazing people I met. That's nothing could be better. I just love that. I love that I've been in prison. Without prison, I've never been in Sweden, never met Stefan or Eva or Kalle or William or Felix or Jacob or, or my American family or my Norwegian family or my, you know, Lisbeth Astrid Karbin who was like supporting me from the first few days in Sweden. You know, mm. it's just so amazing. Life is so fantastic. I know, you know, everything brings a lot of happiness. You just need to to get the, f the perfect, the right look at it. Yeah. If you find the good aspect, if you look at the right aspect, you're gonna have a lot of happiness. You know, life is beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Mm. I have to go. Yeah, yeah. You know, we That's said fine. just goodbye. That's fine. Um, so, Omar, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, if people wanna follow you, they can do it at your website, Omar Al Shogra. Uh, yeah, I you mean, can just Google. I do, I do use I do use Facebook, yeah. Instagram, and you know, and have a website. 
it's not important people follow me. It's important people do something. I yeah. Mean, yeah. And we talked about that, the Syrian emergency uh, task force. Uh, so, Omar, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I thank really you. love your initiative. Thank you. Thank you. See you later.